everybody. My name is Jenny Osborne. I am the Chief Exec of TPAD and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here today to our panel session. We are on day four of National Scrutiny Week. Where is the time going? I don't know. It's been, um, as somebody described to me this morning, exhilarating, fast-paced, exhausting um, and inspiring. Um, I know many of you have been on sessions already this week. If you haven't managed to catch them all, um, please do go and have a look at our YouTube channel um, and you'll find some of those recordings on there so you can catch up in your own time. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, we've got an exciting panel set up for you today. Um, we do want you to kind of get involved later on in the session with some Q&As for our panel, put some great questions to them. We've already had some in advance, which is always helpful. Um, we are now live on YouTube as well as being here on Zoom. Um, we are due to be um, have about 60 people in this session and obviously many more watching on YouTube. So welcome to everybody. Can I just make a couple of housekeepings, a, a reminder about microphones, if you could switch those off, uh, please, uh, just to make sure that we can hear everybody. That would be fantastic. And I'm sure we'll do the Zoom bingo later on of reminding someone they're still on mute when they try to talk. And you want that in every session, don't we? Absolutely. And um, like I say, I'll introduce the panel in a second. We'll do Q&A at the end. Um, we do need to finish for 11.20 today because we are having to switch over then to our exciting fast-paced sessions from, from landlords and tenants across the country, which is starting at 11.30. So a slight scheduling error. Um, but we will switch, so we will stop at 11.20, so lots to get through. Um, if you have any difficulties at all, if you just want to pop that into the chat function, uh, Matt, who's currently just off camera, is the tech support for this session today. So you can either contact Matt directly or pop it in the chat function and myself or Matt will try and pick any concerns up. That's also where I need you to pop any of your questions as well. So be thinking of questions as the sessions are running. Um, and we'll come back to those later and get through as many as, as we can. So I'm delighted to introduce our panel today. Um, we, we've got four people here who are going to talk to you and then and take your questions. We've got Jackie McKinley, Chief Executive of the Centre for Public Scrutiny. Lovely wave there, Jackie. Thank you for that. We've got Dr. Dave McKenna um, as researcher, who many of you again will know and was perhaps you might have been on his session uh, yesterday. Uh, we've got Joan Swift, and Joan's a tenant scrutineer with PA Housing. And we have Caritas Charles with us as well, who many of you will know, who is a TPAS associate and scrutiny specialist. So a great panel for you here today. Um, and we're going to start off now uh, with Jackie, who's going to talk to you for a few minutes about her thoughts on scrutiny to get us going. So thank you, Jackie. Brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, good morning, everyone. Really, really delighted to be able to join you today. Um, I've been watching and enjoying all the exciting events on uh, the Scrutiny Week this week. And I think, as Jenny said, it's been kind of energising and exhilarating, not just to see the brilliant events that were put on, but also the response on Twitter and the, the report and back from tenant scrutiny throughout the land. So it, that's been brilliant. So thanks for the chance to join you. Um, well, in, in response to the question that we were asked, I think it's a really uh, interesting question around why tenant-led scrutiny is important. And I feel like we're amongst friends here. So I'm sure you know a lot of what I'm gonna say, everyone will agree with. But well, I do think you can't stress enough and you can't keep repeating enough why tenant-led scrutiny is important. And I know from the experience of my work, we hear a lot about tenant, you know, scrutiny being about finding out what was gone wrong, finding faults, being there to kind of be negatively, you know, organisations being defensive. Whereas I think we all know that you know, if it's done right, then it's really, really positive experience. We know that scrutiny that's done well and tenant-led scrutiny that's done well will allow us to shape ideas, get assurance, test assumptions that organisations might be thinking about, prompts new thinking and allows new ideas to come. And we know that when decisions are getting made, particularly in a time of stress, and you know we've all been through that over the last six months or so, 
allowing different thinking into a room only leads to better outcomes and better decisions. It's never a negative experience. And it is there to identify gaps and it is there to kind of point out things that, you know, decision makers might not have realised. But overall, it leads to better decisions. And we know whether it's in housing, health, local government, the private sector, having some form of scrutiny, particularly involving those people who are most affected by decisions, leads to better decisions. We know that. But somehow some organisations find that a really difficult thing to do. And as I say, particularly when resources might be tight, not a lot of staff, you know, or not as many staff might be working in the organisation as there was previously, or we're going through a global pandemic that no one's ever experienced before. Trying to lift heads up and trying to find the space to hear people's views can be really, really challenging. So I think that's why it's really important to me. Um, and I think we've known from experiences, negative experiences and tragedies like Grenfell, what can go wrong at the really extreme end where people aren't involved in decision making. But I think, you know, why it's important and why it's essential is for all of those positive benefits that will bring. And I know throughout the week from what I've seen and I know from Dave's publication, there are a number of ingredients that need to be in place in order to make that tenant scrutiny work. And I think the biggest one and what we always check for is that senior buy-in. You know, it's not tenant-led scrutiny. It's not just a tick box exercise or seen as something, oh, we better get on and do this or an activity that sits over there. The best tenant-led scrutiny is when you look at an organization's governance structure and it's there. You can see the lines that take you from tenant-led scrutiny to the decisions that the board are making. And I think if you can see that, and if you can see the impact that your work and your activity is having on the organization's decision-making, you know you're there, you know. So it's those two bits for me. You know, is the activity positive? Is it, does it feel like a positive activity? And then can you see the impact that it's having on decision making? And I think all of that can make it the positive experience that it should be and make the difference and add the value for all the hard work that gets put into it. So that's my contribution. Jenny, not a clue how long that went on for. I was going to press my timer and then obviously forgot. In the <laughs> It was absolutely perfect. I mean, you know, this has never happened in my life of chairing, but we're actually ahead of time. And I just want people to, to take a moment to recognise that because <laughs> it won't end up that way. So, no, absolutely bob on, Jackie, and thank you. And I thought, you know, really interesting couple of takeaways already there, you know, is it positive? And I think that point about can you see the line is a really helpful kind of opening statement for us all to think about uh, and then all think about that as we go through this. Can you see that line from board um, around decision making? Really interesting stuff. Um, okay, thank you, Jackie. I'm going to come now to, to Caritas, who is going to give us his opening, uh, opening thoughts. Thanks, Caritas. Thank you, Jenny, and hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name's Caritas Charles. I thought I'd say a little bit about myself. I've worked in housing for about 20 years. Uh, I'm a TPAS associate, but my other role is I'm the cabinet member for leisure, culture, and community engagement at North Somerset Council. So one of the things I'm doing is bringing some of the lessons that I've learned working in scrutiny um, in the housing sector to local government. And it's uh, actually quite surprising um, at times how little local government knows about effective community engagement. So um, it's a learning curve for everybody. When the brief got sent over, um, Scrutiny means so much to me that I wanted to work out how to kind of address it. So I'm going to take a word um, from each letter that spells out scrutiny and say what it means to me. So first off for the S, statistics, data. It's got a good scrutiny. Why scrutiny is important is when you have good data and good evidence but it's also got to be a balance of data. Um, not just statistics. Statistics can tell you some things, but statistics can be 
bent to mean something good or something bad. You've also got to have quality, quantitative information. That information from people on the ground, from residents and tenants on the ground, from staff members, um, that anecdotal stuff is of equal value to the statistical performance data that you'd look at as scrutiny members. The next thing is comms, communication. Um, as well as being a bit of a data nerd, I'm also a communications nerd. And um, in my role at the council, people almost parrot it before I say it, because I always say, have you got a comms plan with that? And I think with any kind of scrutiny engagement, good scrutiny engagement, it's about having that communication plan. How are you going to communicate with, the, with each other as a scrutiny group? How are you going to communicate with the staff involved, the board, senior management? What are the goals and milestones? And how are you going to look at the successes and relay that to the wider tenant population and the public as well. Having an effective communications plan, I think, is vital. Next is revolutionary. Um, I think some people see scrutiny and just say, we've got to have a group. Um, I'm very much for ripping up the rule book if you want to. Scrutiny can mean so many things. It can be the group, and groups can be amazing and work effectively well. They can be one-day task and finish events. They can be massive online events. And particularly in the situation we're in at the moment, it's about testing out new ideas. Some of them may not work for you, some of them will, but actually being inventive. And I think that's what good scrutiny means always willing to challenge what your perceptions are and look for new avenues. The next is understanding. I think at times um, there's been fault where staff haven't properly understood where tenants are coming from and the tenant experience. And likewise, I challenge as well that sometimes tenants involved don't necessarily understand the staff perspective. And I think good scrutiny is when you develop those relationships with each other and understand where people are coming from at all levels. And I think that's where effective scrutiny lies. Trust is the next thing as well. Trust in the process. If the organisation or the tenants involved don't trust the process, don't have confidence or faith that it's integral to the organisation, then I think there's absolutely no point in actually doing it. You've got to have that trust. Investment. It can't just be a tick box exercise. Organisations must be willing to put time and resources into it. Good scrutiny needs solid investment. Yes, monetary investment. Yes, resource investment. But most important of all, time. Time to do it right. No limits. I strongly believe any housing provider that is confident in itself and the direction in which it's going should have no limits to what is scrutinised. It should be able to open its books and show to its tenants where its direction lie, whether it's with regards to operations, to its investment, its policy, its corporate plan. Good scrutiny, nothing should be off the books. And finally, I want to say why scrutiny is important is because of you. Staff, tenants, people that work in scrutiny and make it effective. That's why it's important to me is those people who go that extra mile and make that extra commitment to improve the services that people receive. And um, hopefully I haven't wrapped it on for too long. That's me, Jenny. Thank you, Caritas. That was great. That was fantastic. Um, I'm really delighted by quarter past ten. We've mentioned the word revolutionary already. So, I mean, I think we're on a, we're on a good panel here, aren't we, in terms of going for it. So, um, and, I, and I love the point about no limits, but linking that to confidence in the organisation. If an organisation is confident, knows what it's doing, 
then it shouldn't have anything to fear about food. And so that's really, really interesting point. Thanks, Caritas. Okay, so um, without even catching breath, I'm going to move us on. Um, and I'm going to move us on now to Joan. Morning, everybody. Morning, Jenny. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this today. Um, Caritas has said quite a lot of what I've um, say and endorse. Um, I've been involved in scrutiny for about eight years and um, and I loved it from the moment that I started doing it and I, I guess maybe passion's a strong word but that's how it's become and I hopefully um, get as much from scrutiny as the, the organisation does. Um, for me, um, it's, a, it's really important that scrutiny remains current and that we're looking for new ideas all of the time. Um, and yeah, that we, we're looking for um, to move on all the time. I mean, uh, I mean, just quickly, I'll say that at the moment we're doing uh, a scrutiny health check, which is to make sure that we are doing the right things ourselves. Um, no limits is absolutely, I would endorse that highly. And I must admit, in all of my experience, um, we have had access all areas uh, in the work that we do, and it's really important. Um, and it's important that staff at all levels understand what scrutiny is, because we don't just in, um, interview st uh, senior staff members, we interview um, staff at all levels. Um, so, you know, I, we build up a rapport and we get to know people and um, getting staff to know um, what we're doing is now at an early stage and it's part of the induction process that they get to know that there's a scrutiny team and what we do. And also, it's really important to say that we're scrutinising services and not members of staff. And I think that's where you can have initial hiccups. If the, you know people come in sometimes because they don't fully understand the process and they sit there and you can see the fear. So we always do a preamble that it's a service, not your job. And, um, and then you can see them absolutely relax into the process. Um, although statistics and data is really important, I think as, as a, a tenant led thing, we have our ears to the ground. So although we do look at data often, um, if we hear common threads going on throughout the communities or the properties, um, we ask to take closer looks at, at, at those, um, at those um, areas. Um, and it, you know, it's always gonna be around grounds maintenance and cleaning and repairs. Um, so we do visit them on a regular basis, but there are other things that we look at and, and I'm really proud to say as a scrutiny team uh, we've recently been tasked there's quite a big spend going on at PA at the moment with um, various things in compliancy and um, decent homes and we were asked because of the spend to um, to scrutinize it and make sure that we uh, value for money was being achieved and I, I take that as a compliment to the scrutiny team that at um, customer services level we're, we're being tasked with doing an important bit of work and being trusted with that. Um, um, the other thing that I need to say as well, we're, we're really fortunate that we have an independent tenant advisor in the process. So all the work we do is independent. We have some, some input from RI, but that's generally about scrutiny care and arranging our meetings and uh, booking rooms, food, and, and things like that. Our tenant advisor is with us at the beginning of the process, the middle and the end, helping us with the report writing. But I, I need to emphasize, he doesn't put his views into the report, it's ours, but uh, he, he guides us. Uh, and that is a vital piece of our work, I think. Um, um, on, um, what I've heard this week as well, it's really helped me. I've loved every day of, 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 the, um, of the meetings this week. And the word um, that I've heard this week that I, I think is useful for all scrutiny um, teams to, to take on board is challenge. Don't be soft, you know, don't be soft. If you've got something to ask, ask it and be direct. 
Um, and, you know, we just work mainly as a team. We, we don't chop and change the team too much. People, it evolves naturally. People don't want to do scrutiny. So, but there'll always be core members of the, of the team doing the work. Um, and I think that's all I can say. I think more about what we do might evolve from questions that I can answer moving forward. Um, but as I say, the main thing to me is we must remain current um, in, in these times um, and um, understand that we do have influence with our housing associations. And, you know, we should embrace that. And uh, it's that that's that's a strong piece of um, advice. In influence embrace the influence that we do have and we have a voice I always say this tenants if you're not part of the scrutiny team or anything to do with resident involvement we do have a voice use it brilliant thank you Joan I, I sort of stopped writing after a bit because there's so many points there that I was trying to pick up on but I want to I, I do think that point um, I'm sure we'll come back to it about rapport is really important that building up a rapport and the fact that you involve um you know it's part of the scrut uh, the induction process for staff um, i know i've had a question in advance about that so i think we might come back to that that how do we get staff on board um and 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 that point really powerful out like, with scrutinizing services not your job i mean I, you know i saw a few nods going when you said that and i think massively valuable point that um, in terms of getting people to, to buy into scrutiny as it were so thank you for that, Joan. And last, but by no means least, I'm going to hand over now to, to Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, how exciting to have a, a scrutiny week. And I've just, I've, I've said it a couple of times this week already, but um, it's just amazing how TPAS have put this together in such a, a short space of time. I think it's been absolutely incredible. And the fact it's kind of coincided with uh, local government's scrutiny's 20th anniversary as well, which has also been quite exciting for us. Um, okay, so I should introduce myself a bit, and I think I'll start with uh, what it means personally for me. Um, I like to introduce myself as a, a scrutiny and governance geek. Did I mention I'm Dave McKenna, by the way? I should say that. Um, and as I, I really like what uh, David over at TPAS Cymru says, uh, every day's a school day, and that's pretty much how I feel about this, and I feel about this session as well. Uh, I've already learned lots, and we haven't even got into the discussion yet. Um, personally, I'm really delighted that tenant scrutiny is such a growing force. For me, I come from a local government background. Uh, I was a scrutiny manager in a council for about 10 years. But before that, I start, started out in housing. Um, I was a tenant participation officer in the mid 90s. Uh, back then, as this old timers like to say, we, uh, we didn't have tenant scrutiny. Um, I was mainly working to support tenant associations, but it's been fantastic seeing this kind of growing up and being able to kind of join these two strands together. And what I particularly like uh, for me personally is the, is the cross learning as well. Just picking up on what Caritas, you said about, you know, being in a position in local government and seeing both sides. And I think it's so important to kind of emphasize, um, yes, what tenant scrutiny can learn from local government scrutiny, but really what local government scrutiny can learn from tenant scrutiny as well, which I think is, which is, you know, I think it's fascinating to me. Um, I don't know, something like mystery shopping springs to mind as something that tenant scrutiny does really, really well, uh, but local government scrutiny, not so much. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's something that I always find fascinating. Um, it's great to go last, obviously, with the introductions, because I can just say, I totally agree with what everybody said, because I think they all made such fantastic points. Um, I love what Jackie said about... Um, you know, allowing different thinking into the room. I think that's so important about scrutiny as well and, and kind of good decision making. As I said, Caritas, your points about the kind of learning was so great. And I, I loved, uh, Joan, you're talking about having an ear to the ground. I think that's that's one of the things that, you know, I think is so important about scrutiny. It just, or any, any governance, any decision making, that you've got people that can just have a feel of what's coming up the road that just know what people are talking about, what people are concerned about and can kind of feed that in. So I think that's that's definitely something that's important. And I guess I can just sort of link back then to, um, you mentioned it already, but very exciting to do the research with TPAS on successful council tenant scrutiny. Um, and as part of that, we did highlight a number of benefits. So I should quickly mention those. Um, 
nothing that that will be a surprise to people, but it's always good to underline them. I think um, scrutiny improves services through the different reviews. It gives value for money because uh, there's nobody nobody cares more about what happens to rent money than the people that actually pay the rent. Um, the relationships between tenants and landlord is improved. It's important for that. I think when people can see that the landlord is involving tenants, they feel more confident in the landlord and what they're doing. Uh, communication and information is important. Scrutiny can have a big impact on improving those things as well as sharing information. And the tenant development part as well, I think is it's, um, it's, it's an interesting opportunity for people. Um, I think it can lead to all sorts of you know, new skills and experiences, and in some cases, even employment. So I think that's you know, where they haven't had it before. So I think, that's, I think those things are all, all really positive as well. I was thinking about what I might mention as well uh, that others might not have. Um, and I guess one thing that occurred to me is, uh, is, is the effects that you can't always see that don't come from the direct work. So uh, the Institute of Government, who are a great organisation, by the way, did a report on parliamentary select committees a few years back, another form of scrutiny. And they found that just the fact that people knew there was scrutiny affected their behaviour, even if their policy or service area wasn't being looked at. The very fact that it might be looked at kept people on their toes and led to be better decisions, even if scrutiny didn't get directly involved. So I think the very fact that there's a scrutiny function outside of all the great work that people do, um, I think is, is really important as well. And it shows, you know, that the, the landlord's serious about doing things in the right way, about being transparent, about being accountable, um, involving people and so on. So I think, I think that's, that's, you know, that's a key thing. Um, and I think the last point I just wanted to make as well was that similar to kind of school governors or community councillors, uh, it's a form of public service doing tenant scrutiny. Um, I think people are active volunteers, they're giving up their time. Um, and I think, you know, they deserve all the applause and credit that they can get really, because I think it's such a, you know, as, as any aspect of good governance, it depends on the people that are willing to, to give their time and commit to it. So yeah, I, I think that's the final point I'd like to end on there. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave, for that. Again, you know, great, you know, different points, always difficult going last, but I thought, you know, your point about what, ten, you know, scrutiny and, and local government scrutiny can learn and share with each other is a really valuable one, hence why we've got people like yourself and Jackie in particular on, on this panel today, because I think that that is crucial. And that, that those are wider effects that you can't always, you're not always sure about. Um, I think it's, an, again, a really valuable point, and I think we need to find a way to kind of keep looking at that capturing that in some way to make sure that because that just goes to play doesn't it to the, the purpose and the, the value of scrutiny so I thought that was you know really really good points to make there that we can all be thinking about as we go through this session okay so we we've had the opening remarks from all of our panel lots to think about there lots of inspiring stuff so I'm, I'm going to start us off with some questions now just a reminder if you want to ask a question if you could pop it into the chat box that's the easiest way for me to be able to kind of see them but equally, as, as the session unfolds, if we get to kind of people doing the wave or putting using the hands up function, um, then that would be great as well. But if you can pop them in the chat box, that would be great. Um, I've already had one in and I'm going to start on one that is a, a really, really common question, I think, around not just scrutiny, but involvement generally. Um, but I'm going to come across all the panel on this one because I'm sure all of you have got a few tips. So any tips for attracting a younger generation? Mm -hmm. um, to scrutiny and um, how do we get more young people involved but that's that's why that out how do we not not just young people but a more diverse range of people involved in scrutiny um, i'm going to come to jackie first just because obviously you spoke first so we haven't heard from you for a while so but you know i'm going to come to everybody um so i'll come back in the sense of in the way that you're all on the panel um, but if you just got one two comments you could make on that that'd be great yeah um i think Jenny, I think once if we crack this one in house and then we'll crack it for everyone because, you know, lots and lots of people uh, struggle with this. And as I live with three very young teenagers, well, not very young, three teenagers, I struggle to engage with them in the house, never mind getting them to kind of think about how they contribute elsewhere. So it is a big challenge. I, so I think there's a couple of things that I'd, um, I'd say. Firstly, uh, people engage on the topics that interest them the most. 
So if we're asking people to engage, it needs to be on things that are important to them. And I'm not saying that will then be easy to get people to engage, but if you're talking about something that is really important to them, then you're halfway there. If you're talking about something that people can't really see what the benefit is, the value of giving their time. So I think that's the first thing. The second is, and I know it's popped up in the in the chat box a couple of times, digital. I, you know, I do think the times that we're now living in, our style of communication is moving more towards being able to engage with a diverse group of people much better. And I know from a local government perspective, um, we've seen more engagement in traditional forms of meeting during lockdown probably because people haven't got as much to do but you know because people can connect from their homes they can connect around their care and responsibilities around their young families in a way that they may be used to if they're used to kind of connecting through snapchat or whatsapp or whatever it might be so i think the style of communication is that important and then the final thing is i think we need to go to where the conversations are already happening rather than wait for people to come to us and the example i always use is you know if you're kind of putting on an event on a rainy uh, november evening which clashes with bake off or whatever else is happening you then wonder why people don't turn up but if you're going along to a conversation in a community group in a library in a pub wherever you know when we're allowed out a bit more then I think that's a way to gather people's views without it feeling really formal. So sometimes, so I think, you know, can we get people involved more is a big, big ask. Can we hear diverse voices and then be reassured that they're, you know, getting heard in decision making? I think that's an easier way sometimes to think about it. And I say, hopefully, one of the benefits that we've seen from the last few months is much more focus on digital, I think will help. Brilliant. Thank you, Jackie. Three great um, tips there. Caritas, can I come to you? Anything to add to that from what Jackie said? Um, I would say to use a variety of options um, and the, not what one size fits all. So definitely, yes, on the use of technology. That is really important. And also try not to be too precious on what scrutiny means. Because I, I do encounter some people go, it must be a formal group. It must be a group that meets regularly. And it's like scrutiny can mean many, many things and many different methods. Yes, that level is important. But you could have digital engagement. You could have task and finish groups. Um, just a quick interesting point. Um, when I was an engagement manager, we did a survey and we asked people, is, is the ability to influence services um, and scrutinise them important to you? 97% of the tenants in the organisation I work with said yes. Would you like to be involved? 86% said yes. How would you like to be involved? Being in a formal scrutiny group was right at the very bottom of the list. But that didn't mean, when we delved deeper, people said, and I think it was like, you know, Jackie said earlier, people said, I want to have my say, I think it's important, but I want to have my say in the things that interest me at a time to interest me. So that you've got to accommodate people's needs. We're in a very fast paced world now. And for a lot of people, a lot of younger people, the idea of being in a group that meets frequently on something isn't particularly appealing. So offering those different options is really, really important. And finally, one thing that really worked for us controversially is we paid people. Um, not a lot, but a token. And um, the age range dropped. When we introduced that, the average age range dropped by 30 years. And we moved to a task and finished base. Um, group of scrutiny. The youngest person was 21. And for every scrutiny project, we had a waiting list of people wanting to be involved. So um, it used different methods, I think. Did you say 30 years and not 13? 30? 30 years by average it dropped. Wow, that, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, really good. Um, I know it's awful when you're kind of 
third and fourth. So apologies, Joan and Dave. But any other top tip to add to that? I'll come to you first, Joan. Um, I don't know if there is a top tip because, you know, um, there is a struggle. Um, paying, um, we, we don't get paid, but we get gift cards. Is that, is that what would draw people in? I don't know. I do, however, think something that does put younger people off or some people in general is the word scrutiny. I think the word scrutiny is quite heavy and um, I understand what scrutiny is, but if you're looking to go into something and you see scrutiny, I think the automatic thought is, I can't do that. Uh, and I think, I don't, know, I don't know what other words you could use, but I think that's, that's it. Um, um, outside, of, um, outside of lockdown, I think, um, we have to learn that we have to go to them as opposed to expecting them to come to us and being more um, flexible with the times that we use Saturday mornings because people are working in the week. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's such a hard thing to crack at the moment, getting young people or the demographics changing, um, you know, and, and people don't want to be stuck with oldies like me all the time. They need, you know, they need to see some young blood um and i am um, uh, and paying people's fine um but then you have to think about the people that would come on board that are on benefits and um it would affect benefits and things like that so i've got no i've got no big tips but um i think the biggest thing for me is the word scrutiny i think that that's an interesting point joan it's kind of one of the questions that we, we've got that maybe you come back to a little bit about that about scrutiny does it need a rebrand or what does it put people off or not? Well, we might come back to that one later on. Um, Dave, just come to you if there's anything else you want to add from this. You know, attracting younger people or a more diverse demographic. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great points uh, already. Sort of underline Jackie's point about going to where people are. Um, I think that that's a really key one. And I, I, I think giving people a gift or a payment of some kind, I don't think it's controversial at all, actually. I think it's, I think it's what you'd expect for taking part in, in research. Normally, I think it, it's pretty common. So I think, that's, I think that's always a really good idea. And it's great to hear from Caritas how that's worked. So, you know, if it works, I think we should definitely do it. A couple of things that, that haven't been mentioned, perhaps. Um, I know other people have found when they've done in-depth pieces of scrutiny work where they have managed to talk to some young people that they've built into that the idea that the young people might come and actually come and observe a meeting or something else on the back of it so it kind of acts as a sort of a stepping stone um to to maybe see if people are, are more interested in getting involved so that that's one little thing um i think it's always helpful to talk to the people that work with different groups so that if you want to involve uh, young people for example um, in a piece of scrutiny, it's always a good idea to, you know, can you speak to the youth workers? If you're working with a local council, then there might be a couple of people working for the council whose job it is to, to do that. Can you talk to the people at the, the sort of, you know, the local youth centre if there is one and so on. So who are the people that work with the people that you want to, to contact and have a chat with them first? Um, and yeah, I, I, I think those numbers uh, sound absolutely spot on. We heard about the kind of levels of interest that people might have in these things. But there's always one or two people I think you find. There's always one or two superstars that are like a gift if you can find them. Um, and I think you just have to kind of care and nurture those people as much as you can and, and help and support them uh, to, to be involved. Um, and one of the things that you can perhaps do is if you do find a young person that's interested or whatever group you're talking about, is to co-opt them onto your group for that piece of work and just get them involved to, to give you an insight and to give you some advice about how you might how you might do things. So there's a couple of other things that I know other people have, have found helpful. Great, great answers from the panel there. And I think if there's some chat going on as well in the chat box about people using gift cards. Um, and I think Caritas, you just replied, I think there's a question for, from somebody about kind of how much that was, if Caritas, if you, could, if you can remember and if you could pop that in the chat box to answer that, that would be great. Um, while we, we carry on some other questions, but I think there's some really good good tips there for, for getting more people involved. I'm going to take a question that we that we received in. I um I know, and we might come back to the monetary stuff. I know a few people are still commenting on that. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to some questions that got sent in advance. One's from John, who I know is on the on the session with us, but I'll take one of 
those questions that you sent to us in advance, John Tannen. So, and I'll probably come to Jackie on this one first, I think. Um, can board members be allowed to participate in the scrutiny process? If they can be, is that not a conflict of interest and an issue for governance of the organisation? Can I ask you to take that one, Jackie, first? Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting one because I think it's um, it does come up quite a lot, and you know I I think one of the fundamental principles is you can't mark your own homework, so you know you can't be involved in a decision and then be asked to scrutinise it. It's just a really basic kind of idea to have in your head. And so I think for me, that means a board member who is taking decisions can't sit in scrutiny. Now, the question then is, can they be involved in scrutiny? And I think they can, but you just need that little bit of a divide, which is they are being scrutinized. They're there to give information. They're there to give evidence. They're there to be held to account. They're there to kind of be interviewed, whatever it might be. But I do think that divide, which is, you know, an independent scrutiny function, however supported it might be and resourced and, you know, and sitting really as a kind of solid part of the governance framework. But it does need that independence, I think, to be able to hold to account. And one of the things that frees scrutiny up is it's not making the decision. It's making recommendations, it's challenging, it's testing asking the questions that decision makers might not, you know, be able to ask or have the kind of uh, brain space to ask. So I think the answer would be no, but it does then mean what do we mean by involved? So I think they can't be formally part of it, but, you know, obviously we want it to be a process where a board member is feeling like they're influenced and what scrutiny is looking like, asking scrutiny to look at things, but you just need that independent thought, I think, and, and space to be able to do it. Thank you, Jackie. That's really, really helpful. John Townend, you asked that question. You, you, you posed that in advance. Is, is something else you want, perhaps want to ask or say about that? Yes, uh, um, we don't do it in our organisation. We have strict lines of demarcation. Board members cannot participate in scrutiny whatsoever. And we find that very positive. We would allow board members to come alongside and monitor the process, but they can't participate in it. Because the board does need to be sure that the process is fair and is working properly. And how else can they do that other than by looking at the reports and ensuring that the conversations that we have with staff, which they have a duty of care to, the board members, um, they need to ensure that the process is fair and is treating staff fairly. Um, because if you're going to challenge some people, and I'm, I'm talking to some tenants, may get over enthusiastic and challenge a little bit too robustly because emotions are involved. So I do think that board members can oversee the project and monitor the project, but I, I must be absolutely firm, they should not, not participate in the scrutiny themselves. I think that really does conflict with the governance issues, but that's for other people to decide, obviously. Okay, thank you, John, for that. Did Joan, Caritas or Dave, any of you want to come in on that point? Anything else? Can I move on? Caritas? I just to completely agree with John's point, absolutely, that you can't, you know, have a board member actively participate in that. But it depends what you mean by participate. I think what you've got to have for effective scrutiny, though, is access to those people who readily have the data and can make decisions. And I'd also challenge it's not necessarily the board member. Actually, the people you need are the middle management people within housing associations, the operations people. So if you want that data and information, they're the people that can give you quick and steady answers. So if by not participating in the devising of the scrutiny, but you should have ready access to those operational people that can give you the, the information you need quickly. 
Okay. Yes, and Joan, I think you want to come in and then I'll come back to you, John. Yeah, Joan and then Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking, um, being, if a board member's involved, that they're, they're, you know, they'd be part of interviewing senior management maybe the CEO directors and things like that and I don't think that's appropriate anyway I mean my answer to the question is no but um it's uh, yeah I, I feel quite strongly it's no <laughs> sorry um yeah they just can't interview staff like that or be a part of that part but, yeah okay Jen, I'm going to come back to you John just for a final point because it was your question yeah actually John's just covered it um I need to be quite clear that within the different sectors, um, I represent an Almo group. So I'm slightly different on governance to housing associations. So please take on board that I'm not quite the same as perhaps the majority of the group. I believe the group is housing associations in the main. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a mix, but yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, probably a slightly more housing association. So um, thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm going to take another question. Um, I haven't can't see another one just popping up at the moment. Um, I think we've got comments coming in. So thank you for those. And if we can all keep an eye on those comments and you're chatting for yourselves is great on there and, and all helping each other with answers. There's a question that came in from Gemma, uh, community involvement officer. Um, I'd like to ask, how do you give control? Of a scrutiny group of a scrutiny project to a whole group where you have found it's been dominated by two or three individuals without it feeling like involvement staff are taking over or getting too involved we her group currently doesn't have a panel chair to try and help with this but are there any other ideas from the panel about how we stop um certain individuals or people for on a project um taking control or dominating any any thoughts on that can i can I come to you first, Joan, and then perhaps to you, Dave, on that one? Yeah. Um, for us, uh, I mean, we have scrutiny leads. We do ours in two parts. So there's a lead to one part of the process and a lead um, to another part of uh, the scrutiny part of the process. But this is where, for us, the independent tenant advisor um, becomes useful because they can they can be the bargaining chip if you like and then that frees ri not to be involved um apart from doing the day-to-day -day caring of booking rooms etc calling for documents and uh, so the independent tenant advisor can communicate with the leads of the of the projects and um we find that that that's that sorts things out at the beginning um, and we don't have a panel chair either. We we found because I think the geographics and because we're a fairly new merged um, organisation, it, it wasn't working. But I, I just absolutely feel this is where an independent body has a huge part to play. Okay, thank you, Joe, for that. Dave, can I come to you for some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, obviously it's it's tricky without knowing exactly what the what the situation is. But but generally, I always um, I always wonder if if people are when people describe people as dominating. For me, I kind of hear people are getting very actively involved, um, and actually that might be something to to celebrate where people are actually kind of giving some time and some commitment and so on. So I guess that's that's the first thing is I'd be keen to. To kind of make sure we protect that and you don't kind of um you know people are giving up their time and energy not not to kind of push that back in any way because you want to capture it and use it as the best you can so maybe it's I, I guess it might be a case of just having a conversation with people about how they feel the group is going and what they they think might work better so for me it's um it's always about trusting the group at the end of the day everything might not work exactly as you expect it to from the outside but i think you know, people people are pretty smart. <laughs> people pretty much know how things are going to work. And if you can ask those questions about, oh, um, you know, how can we make sure everybody's involved? Then people will have good ideas. And I guess the only other the other point I think sometimes is useful is is whenever people have contact with other groups and have conversations, um, I think, and see how other groups are working as well. That can give people ideas about how to to work better. But I guess for me. Um, look for the positives in what's happening in the situation and trust the group to be able to to work through it thank you 
Um, I've got a hand up back. I'm going to come back to so Joan first, and I'm going to go to Tom Dalton wants to come in. So I'm going to go to John, to Joan first. The other thing is, is if it's an active scrutiny and you're all in the room or you're, vir you know, you're doing it virtually, we, before we start the day, we have a check in from the day before. If it's something bothering you or people are getting agitated, we try and stop, sort those things on a daily basis. And, and that sort of works out as well, because at the end of the day, we're all adults and um, um, we um, nip it in the bud. So, yeah, we review our, uh, our bits and pieces every day before we start. So um, hopefully that stops people being given too much control and being dominating. Um, two way conversations going on, you know. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Joe. Um, Tom, you wanted to come in? Uh, thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm a, a, a tenant member of a housing advisory panel for a local authority. So we sit as tenant reps uh, as part of that panel, but the scrutiny is only carried out by uh, the tenant reps. The councillors that are on the panel don't take any part in that. Uh, and one of the interesting things has been this idea of dominant um, personalities getting involved. And the way we've kind of, the way it's been handled for us, um, the support that we get from the local authority is in the form of an officer who's actually involved in democratic services. And she's been very experienced at dealing with councillors. Uh, now, councillors have a particular personality. So she's actually quite good at, at controlling the dominant personalities that get involved um, and it's it's been it's quite interesting the, the tenants just want to get on with the job but there are some tenants that have a particular um, bug that they want to you know get at um, our support is very good at just kind of calming the waters and, and keeping that going and I, and I think it's been interesting over the week listening to the different experiences I have to say I think we in Wigan have pretty much got it right. It's a really effective scrutiny panel. We're, we're working well. We're working well with the councillors, uh, the politicians, if you will. We work well with the staff. I think we've got it right, and, and I'm quite pleased and to have had that kind of reinforced listening to, to other people this week. Uh, but yeah, that's been our experience. It, it helps if you've got someone that's good at controlling. Okay, I, I love that. When you know someone makes a comment and the wry smiles that went on from you all that I could see <laughs> about that was hilarious. So thank you for that, Tom. Uh, I know Jackie wants to come in and I'm also going to come to Caritas because he's a councillor. So I want him to come back in as well on, on that with his wry smile. But Jackie first. Yeah, uh, we, I'm not going to comment on the kind of type of person that becomes a councillor as I've got one on the rock box, the virtual box for me is the right. <laughs> I think this has been, a, this is really had a helpful conversation and i agree with dave in that you know you have to and i think there was a, a comment in the in the chat box from katie about you have to build on people's strengths but i think we have to also be very honest about how hard it can be when you've got difficult characters or you know people who thrive and enjoy a meeting environment compared to other people that where that might not be there their natural home. And I think what we've heard from Joan and Tom is what you can do when you're kind of experienced and confident in managing different types of people, whether it's a democratic services officer or Joan, love the idea of the check-in and other things. So I think it's probably just being very honest about, sometimes you might need some help in knowing how to manage different types of personalities and different experiences and that could be chairing skills it could be coaching it could be mentoring it could be seeing how other people do it as in Tom's example because it's not always a natural thing to operate in a meeting environment and as I say some people thrive and that might be seen as being domineering because they're loving it that's how they draw their energy and you know they're kind of really into it whereas you might have some quieter introvert people or some people who lack experience. So I think it is just being about that level of honesty about sometimes you might need to skill up and get a bit more kind of knowledge and confidence in order to get the best out of everyone in the room. Yeah, incredibly, that's a really good point. Caritas, can I come to you? Um, yeah, Tom, I, I get your point where councillors can certainly be characters. Um, I've only been in office for just over a year and I've certainly met a few, 
uh, in my time. Um, but one of the lessons I did learn, which I think can be really useful for scrutiny um, as a counsellor, is I'm an independent counsellor where we're the largest group in coalition with Labour, Greens and the Liberal Democrats. And um, one of the th rules that we had very early on was no surprises, no surprises in how we work together, that we are truthful and honest with each other about where we're going. And it does work. And I think it's also about understanding people's individual learning styles and working styles. So, you know, your dominant person could be someone who's, as others have said, just really likes acting in that way. And that quiet person that's beavering away in the corner is still playing a really valuable role. Um, and, and, you know, there is training, T-Pass offer it, plug, 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 where you can actually um, understand how people work as groups. And I would encourage that, kind of try and get to understand each other and how other people work. And sometimes that breaks down the friction that can be caused with groups, because a lot of the time it's just a misunderstanding of people's working styles and how they work. So I would take that when you're a new group in particular, I take that opportunity to get to know each other first and how each other works, because it will solve a lot of problems down the line. Okay, thank you, Caritas. Um, looking in the chat, James Temple, you've asked a question there. Do you want to ask it yourself rather than me reading it out? Are you happy to do that, James? Yes. Yes, great. I have to remember, click, then speak. That's okay. Um, uh, I wrote, uh, some housing associations have no scrutiny panels. Um, TPAS encouraged scrutiny as an effective tool for both local authorities and housing associations. Could the development of assurance panels be as effective in local authority housing association accountability by its residents? Okay, so talking about assurance panels, I'm going to probably come to, to Dave and Jackie. So if I can come to, if I come to Jackie first and then to Dave, is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. So, so James, can I just clarify, when you, when you talk about something being an assurance panel, is that a different set of responsibilities, do you think, than, than scrutiny, so holding to account, influence and decisions, review and performance? Um, uh, TPAS uh, ran a wonderful session on uh, assurance, yeah. and specifically assurance panels. Um, the insurance panels have a slightly larger remit than a standalone scrutiny panel. Yeah. But the limit would also include scrutiny. Yeah. And, and as it's at the same level as the board, um, the members of the assurance panel would have access all areas. Yeah. And would be able to carry out in depth scrutiny of, of data. Um, and uh, be able to report directly to the board with any recommendations. Um, and as their remit is that little bit bigger, um, and they are seen at the same level as the uh, Housing Association board, um, it might prove to be a far more effective means of achieving good, honest scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, I, th I thought that was the I thought that was the case. So I, you know, I think that the um, the answer to the question is what what we would always want to see is an individual organisation design and an approach to scrutiny and assurance in a way that best meets their needs. And I think what's interesting since since we've had Grenfell, since we've had a much you know much kind of sharper focus on tenant-led scrutiny, we are seeing more assurance type panels starting to appear. So as housing associations are reviewing what they're doing, they're starting to think about something that, as you say, James, is positioned much closer to the board, has that access all area. What we're also seeing though, is some tenant-led scrutiny getting similar powers. 
without that formal step being taken. And I think, as Joan said before, sometimes it's about not worrying too much about what something's called, but making sure that it's got the right access, the right powers, you know, access to information, the confidence, etc. So I think if we have to, you know, if we want to call something an assurance panel and get it in there and build it on based on that model and that model works in that organization, brilliant. If, however, you've got something slightly different that's called something slightly different, but you're feeling like you're getting the same level of influence, that's also the case. So I know Jenny and my organization, we promote models, but also we say to organizations, just crack on with it. You know, sometimes worrying about the structures and where stuff sits distracts from what actually can be making a real benefit. So I think there's pros and cons to both there. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Uh, Dave, do you want to come in on that? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked uh, Jackie first because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not totally familiar with assurance panels, but I, I think uh, just to, to agree with what Jackie said and just to, I think just the, the other thing is just to underline, um, we, we have a saying um, about how culture eats structure for breakfast uh, and it's really in a way the most it's it, the structures are important but the most important things are how people behave in those structures um there's certainly a lot of conversations in local government about having slightly different setups whether that's in scrutiny we have you know debates about should we have overview committees and scrutiny committees or overview and scrutiny committees or you know performance and review committees or even should we not have sort of cabinets should we have committees all these kind of things but at the end of the day and i think Jackie and, and the Centre for Public Scrutiny would agree that it's it's all about, and they would say it's all about actually how people behave in those structures that are the most most important things. So yeah, so I think make sure people are doing the right things, behaving in the right ways, getting access to information, um, having that constructive scrutiny relationship, and in a way um, the you know the the structure or the particular group might slightly take second place to that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dave, Jackie. Thanks, James, for the question. Really appreciate that. Um, can I move us on to, can I, Kate, would you be happy to, you've popped something in the chat box about six hats. And I just wonder whether you wouldn't mind just, if you don't mind, speaking, <coughs> just explaining what that is to people, because I'm sure a few people are going to be intrigued about that. Hi, yes. Um, it's, I can't remember the name of the psychologist, but it's, um, it's quite a well-known um, form of getting to know your members of t a team and where they sit. Uh, the six hats, if I could reach my piece of paper, I'd tell you more about it, but I can't. Um, you ha mm. There's the six hats are six colors. So you share out a black hat, a white hat, a blue, green, yellow, red um, amongst the team. And the, each hat has a different trait. So that might be a positive person, a dominant person, uh, the next one might be a much quieter person. Uh, the next one might be somebody who sees the negative in all things. And then you, you pose a question and somebody is the moderator. I think it's the white hat perhaps is the moderator. And they field the question um, and get all the different personalities which people have taken on according to the hat they have in their hands. Um, they have to be that person. They have to take on that personality. And then you swap and you come around and, you know, you might go from being a negative one to a positive one. You might suddenly become the person who has to find the negative um, aspect. Um, and one of the questions that we used was really funny, was um, should all the um, Housing Association staff, um, Selwood, by the way, in Wiltshire, uh, should they all wear uniform? And one of the new members came up and said, yes, I think they should all wear lederhosen. And so the argument was throughout all these six different personalities, the pros and cons of wearing lederhosen to work. And should they, the operatives wear them out in the field as well, you know. And we learned so much from that process about the different people, the, the senses of humour, their negative or positive traits, how talkative they were, how quiet they were, how reluctant they were to join in or whatever. It's an absolutely brilliant team building exercise. Uh, if you wanted me to uh, forward a piece of paper that explains it better than I can, um, I will do. But it's a great tool, a great tool. 
Thank you, Kate. That's really helpful. And, and I know Gemma's popped something in the chat box about that you're there going to be using that as well, and we'll share that. I've seen a couple of hands go up. It's difficult because I already can see one screen, but I've seen Joan try to come in with something. And then, Alison, were you putting your hand up? No, no. Okay, Joan, I'll come to you. Um, the name of the doctor is Dr. Edward de Bono, so that's that one solved, and it's on Google. Um, I've forgotten what it was now. Um... Oh gosh, I've forgotten what it was. No, not. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Going back to James, um, on the no nonsense scrutiny the other day, um, and I'm, I'm guessing it's on YouTube, um, uh, assurance panels was brought up. So if you watch that, you can hear comment and hear what Louise had to say about it as well, if that's helpful. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to try and crack us on with a few more questions then because we're, we're, we've got 15 minutes left and we've had some other questions come in. Um, and one that came in that I'm not sure if David's on the, the, the session today. Um, so just a, a, some practical questions um, around how long do you give or would you recommend as a panel um, for a review of recommendations? So how long do you give for kind of actions we've got in place? for things to happen, how long do you give between that? I think it was, it was a practical question. Um, and also just a question about, you know, and I think I'll come to you, Joan, on this. Have you had to present any reviews of recommendations during kind of lockdown? Uh, and how have you done that? And how was that received? So a couple of practical questions about length of time and presenting to the board, how people do that. Can I come to you first, Joan? Yeah, um, we're well, strangely, we're just looking at action plans at the moment. And uh, there's one scrutiny going to go through to customer services committee uh, uh, in September. Um, I think it varies with the time of looking at the action plan, um, depending on the action. Um, but we hope to review, um, maybe it's a little bit too long. Uh, we haven't tried it yet, but six months, uh, definitely. But we really need to be keeping on top of these action plans. Otherwise there's no point in us, point in us doing the work in the first place. Um, so at the moment it's six six week uh, six months sorry, um, but keeping an eye on it um, in between. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Caritas, any thoughts from you on this around some of the practical stuff about giving the length of time and and how you present to board? Oh, I, oh. I think Joan had something to add. Did you have something to add, Joan? Presenting to um, board, well, we, we don't present directly to the main board, we do it to customer services committee. Um, and that's taken there by the lead of the scrutiny team um, who will answer questions and give updates on the current state of play with the action plans. Um, you know, and it de depends when the scrutiny finishes as to what time we catch the board, the, the, uh, the committee. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Caritas? Yeah, I mean, I haven't got much more to add to Joan, really, rather than to say that I think it's really important to, it depends on the project, but it's also really important to set very clear timelines for reporting back. But also going back to my comms plan thing is how are you going to communicate it not just to the, the scrutiny group or the task and finish group, but how are you actually going to report the actions from the scrutiny action to the wider tenant body as well? Because um, it shouldn't just be an internal exercise. You should say that this is something that is happening and we're taking direct action because of your involvement. So I think those timelines have to include the comms plan as well in that. Okay, and don't mute yourself just yet, Caritas, because I'm going to come straight back to you, because a question from James around um, boot camps as a means of scrutiny. Now, as somebody that was uh, part of uh, one of our early thinking about boot camps, you, you know, in your previous organisation did that. Do you want to just quickly talk about that? But yes, and if everyone, anybody else is using boot camps, could pop some answers for James into the chat, that'd be really helpful as well. But Caritas, just some quick thoughts on boot camps and the effectiveness of those. Yeah, we moved to doing scrutiny boot camps um, when our formal scrutiny group just wasn't the right fit for us. And we did actually a review of how scrutiny works. 
And one of the things that our involved tenants complained about was the length of time that these things were taking. They were taking six months to a year. By introducing the boot camp approach, um, we actually reduced the time we did a scrutiny project to three weeks. And um, that was by using a method of um, having survey data from tenants as to what priority areas they wanted looking at, then doing focus groups to refine down the questions that needed to be answered, and then doing a concentrated two-day um, event with staff and members of the scrutiny panel that were randomly selected um, from the tenant body to actually come up with solutions. And that very kind of fixed period worked really well. And like I said earlier, it dramatically reduced the age, um, the balance of people actually being involved. And I had former scrutiny members who were in formal groups saying, why didn't we do this years ago? It really, really works. And it also gives that element that people can choose so when we did about three or four of these before I left, and some people were in all of them because they were really interested in being all of them, and some people only dipped in and out of a couple, and we had waiting lists to do them so we could actually get a good mixture of people. Um, personally, I think, you know, it might not be for everyone, but it was one way of making scrutiny really effective, quick, and in a really short time. That's really helpful, Curtis. Thank you. But I, you know, an interesting point coming from from Gemma, and unless Gemma wants to say it itself, I'll I'll just read that out. That it's in the chat box about you know your experience, Gemma, was you got a lot more people involved, so it was a great way for kind of tackling some of that. But there was just too many recommendations that came out of the day and <laughs> didn't feel tenant led enough. So I think that's an interesting challenge, isn't it, about handling a boot camp. Um, and how you, you set that up in advance and how you, I, as you say, Gemma, live and learn from that to make sure it is achieving what you wanted to. But uh, yeah, too many recommendations can be can be problematic. I can understand that. Any other comments from the rest of the panel about different approaches to doing scrutiny before I leave this question and we'll move on to another one? Anybody? Oh no, we'll move on. Okay, I'm gonna go back to a question um, we've had in from, from John again. Um, and I'll probably come to, to, to Jackie first um, on this one. Um, many, most scrutiny procedures have a staff member to guide and assist with scrutiny. But should the member of staff ideally write the final report or are they there just to give guidance on language and tone, etc.? So can I just ask you to take that one, Jackie, first? Uh, yeah, really happy to. And another good Good question. I, th I think this was something that Joan referenced um, earlier on in her introduction. Um, so the support, any support from anywhere to help and, you know, give capacity and uh, expertise to, to tenant-led scrutiny is always welcomed. But it is that fine line between not, an, not allowing people to kind of influence their own views. And it's probably something Gemma picked up through her bootcamp experience is how do you use that capacity to enable good tenant-led scrutiny? And I think, you know, that person can write the report. They may have the, the time, the skills, you know, the, the resource to do it, but it can't be their views that they're putting across. So I think you just need to know that that's something that you as a committee and you as a kind of uh, tenant-led scrutinies are doing, but it can't be their views. So, and I think it is just recognising that, um, you know, good support to a committee can really make it fly um, and it's essential, but you just need that line there that it's not their views that they're putting across, they're kind of communicating your own and you need to be I mean someone described it uh, we ran a session earlier this week for a cooperative who were very keen for us to write their plan for them 
and we said it would be like writing someone's love letter for them. It may be beautifully written, but if it you know, doesn't reflect who you are and what you're trying to communicate, it doesn't really matter. And I think the same would apply here. You'd need to be confident as a committee that that report reflects who you are, what you're trying to communicate, and in a style and a language that reflects that. And if it gets too far away from that, then it would start to lose its impact, I think. Great. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, just just to just to add to that, because I, I did this a lot. So I've written I've drafted a lot of reports in my time. I think the I think the important thing is to make sure you've got a process that you're happy with. So the person that's mm -hmm. drafting the report that you're talking to them at the start about what's going to go in the report. They understand what are the kind of main things you want to have in there. Um, they'll come back with a later draft that you can then change. Um, and so on. So you, you just need to get that process that's just right for you with the person that's, that's drafting it. And the final thing that we, we would always do as well is that we would always have um, the, the kind of the foreword, the introduction, the first bit of the report would be written by the chair of the panel or whoever it might be. So you definitely always have that, those words at the start, which come straight from, from the people that are, are leading the work. So, so yeah, I think it's always good to have a support to, to draft and write the reports, but in a way that you're really happy with, you've got control over the content, as Jackie said. Okay, so Caritas, then I'm gonna to come to Jack and you both wanna answer on this one. Um, I only had a quick point to add is sometimes people get a little bit precious about reports and think they have to be huge technical documents. Um, you know, I've seen some that was like, I've seen scrutiny reports that like 26 pages long with over 100 recommendations. And it's, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you in on a secret. You know, I've sat in my other role as a counsellor, I sit reading an awful lot of reports and most people don't read all of it. They mm -hmm. read the summary and they read the key recommendations. Yes. And I think a decent report has to be short, concise, get to the point, and that's what you need to do. And, um, you know, I, anybody can do that. You sometimes need a little bit of assistance for composition, and there might be a style that an organisation uses, but don't be afraid of reports. Anyone can do them with a little help. Thanks, Caritas. I'll come to you, Jo. Um, yeah, I just um, sort of would like to make it clear that when we do our reports, although we have an independent tenant advisor, we sit round the table and input from the notes that we take and the evidence we gathered. We don't give him all the evidence and let him go off and do the report at home. We are there physically inputting what goes into the report. So they are our words, not... And um, it's... A, it's quite often a two-day process because we have to iron out our thoughts uh, clearly. But um, yeah, we don't let somebody go off and do the report for us. It's done co on a collaborative basis around the table. Yeah, great point. I think that's a great point coming from, from Joe Botek, John Botek to say about, you know, you need to be able to write good reports, they need to be concise. And I certainly, as a board member myself in another hat, I think Caritas's point is dead right. When we see the reports coming in from our scrutiny panel for our organisation, it you know it is concise. It is the recommendation, but with the knowledge that the board members all understand the process that have gone underneath that and have confidence in the process mm. that's gone underneath that. But we don't we don't can't got time to read every single part. But you want to be focused on the changes. That's the main thing, isn't it, about what scrutiny is looking to do. I'm really conscious about time. We've only got a few more minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to end us on some really a positive note, hopefully. So I'm going to come to each of the panel members um, with this question, and then I'll, I'll do some housekeeping while you, get, while you think about it. For all the panel members, what have you seen as the biggest difference scrutiny have made in an organisation? So just try and sum us up one big thing that you've seen where, well, it doesn't have to be big, small, a recommendation, a process, a scrutiny review that you thought that made a difference. Um, and if we could just kind of hone in on that. Just before we come to the panel to wrap up on that positive end, um, just a reminder that um, you can catch up on all of the things that have been happening on National Scrutiny Week on the TPAS website and YouTube channel. We've got our showcase sessions kicking off in about 10 minutes where we've got loads of organisations coming on to tell you going on for a few hours. So dip in and out to that. And then tomorrow we'll be wrapping up Scrutiny Week with some stuff around kickstarts 
um, and also the launch of our national um, inquiry that Dave will be coming back for to talk to you about as well. So look out for that tomorrow. Um, so, OK, I'm going to come around the panel and because I've seen to have come to Dave last on quite a few of them, I'm going to start with Dave. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm going to come to you about, you know, the biggest impact or difference you've seen scrutiny make. You're on mute, Dave. Oh, we got the one in in the end to say to somebody. Dave, you're on mute. It was all going so well, wasn't it? It was, but you know, I I'm thought everything was in. working so effectively. <laughs> um, I, was, I was just rapidly going through my notes here. It's just oh, a big, big difference. Um, I think it was, I, this is off the top of my head, so apologies if I get this wrong, but I should quote something from the successful scrutiny um tenant scrutiny council tenant scrutiny report that i've just done so i i, I seem to remember that uh i was i almost fell off my chair when i think it was hull said that they did uh, they did an inquiry and it made sixty thousand pounds worth of, of savings so um and that was a review of caretaking so I, th I thought that was one very specific uh and direct one although it's quite I think if I if I'd had a bit more time, I could probably come up with quite a list. But that was uh, yeah. But at least I've gone first now, and I could expect the other people can uh, come up exactly. with something. Exactly. No, no, that's a great one. I mean, Hull is a is a great example, and there are others, aren't they, in the report that 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 Dave um, published this week? So please do all go and have a look at that for some more examples that are contained in there. So um, I'll come to um, Caritas next. Um, I I wouldn't highlight a specific scrutiny report or anything like that i would like to highlight the process and the people that i've worked with tenant wise on scrutiny groups the the way that they've engaged the way that they've got the best from it and it's actually developed things that they've done in their lives as well as dave mentioned earlier the skills that they've learned the pure enjoyment they've had from it and I think that's one of the things that I've really taken from scrutiny is that people feel empowered, they feel their voice matters, they feel they have control, and they also feel that they're learning new skills as well. And that's one of the really important things I've taken away. And for staff that have worked in scrutiny is that sense of feeling when they've sat and worked with people who are scrutineers that I've had staff come back to me and say, it's been so insightful for me. It's given me a completely new take on my job. And I actually feel energized from the process. So I actually think on the personal level for an individual and an organization, that's where the benefits of scrutiny can really be effective and have that cultural change that's really essential. Thank you, Caritas. Thanks for that. It's really helpful. And Joan, and then I'm going to end with Jackie. Um, totally agree with Caritas. So um, the, one of the major um, results that we had, the, the first ASB specialist was um, in, um, engaged at, at, at the former Paragon, and that's led on now to a, a highly successful tenancy solutions team. So that, that was a good bit of work from the recommendation, yeah. Right, thank you. Thanks, Joan. And Jackie? Um, I think there's, as Dave and, and Joan have said, some brilliant specific examples where there's been a savings change and a service change. I think for me, um, the biggest impact comes when you can see the board's decision make and change them because they are reminded about what's most important to people and what's most important to tenants. And very often that isn't the new development down the road that's gonna bring in multi-million pounds to the company. It is about what makes a home and what gives people that feeling of security and feeling safe. And I think for me, that's the biggest impact that tenant scrutiny can have. And as Karis has said, that can be the, from the process. But to see that kind of reminder, just jutting into that board thinking is where the most impact can come. And you see it in other sectors as well, you know, where it might be special education needs or others, just that reminder that people are human and a reminder that this is what makes a home and people feel safe, then it's, it's the kind of best feeling in the world, really. And we will end on that very, very positive point. Seeing that line, let's all keep that in our mind. That, that line from Jackie, can you see the line? And I think that's a big part of that. So 
Can I ask you to all just kind of virtual clap, but thank you to our panel who were fantastic here today. Thank you for all your questions and thank you for all your comments in the chat box, helping each other and telling each other about what you're doing. That's been, that's been really helpful. Um, it's been a delight to be part of this panel today. Um, so on behalf of everyone at TPAD, thank you so much and take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.